and welcome to Living Writers Online. I'm Jennifer Bryce. Today I'm speaking with my colleague David McCabe, a professor of philosophy here at Colgate and also director of the Division of Arts and Humanities. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. We're talking about Bill Barich's book, Laughing in the Hills, which was serialized in The New Yorker, then published in book form in 1980, 15 years after he graduated from Colgate. Um, it was his first book. It made his reputation. He went on to become a staff writer for The New Yorker and to publish many other yeah. books of fiction and nonfiction, some of which I have here beside me. Most recently, An Angle on the World, a wonderfully titled collection of magazine writing over the decades. One reviewer calls the book that we picked for living writers Laughing in the Hills, a work of superb track journalism. It seems to me more than that, though. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's telling us a lot about the world of the racetrack in great detail and clearly and carefully. But, um, you know, this connects to an issue you and I were just talking about, about who's, who would be interested in reading this book, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, because to describe it as track journalism suggests like it's got this audience mm -hmm. and those are the people it's written for and it's not seeking to go beyond them. So I was thinking a little bit about this, reading this book. My sense is that there are, you know, maybe like three potential groups of people who who might pick this book up. One is the people, one is the group of people who's just totally fascinated with horse racing and race tracks and follows it very closely, those kinds of people. I'm not that kind of person. There are some of those people, but I think that's like not a huge amount of people. Then there's a kind of person like me who likes the horses, follows the Triple Crown when it comes around in the spring, occasionally goes to watch them run, knows a little bit about some, you know, famous jockeys, etc. Um, and so we're already, we're like already have taken a step into this world that he's describing and ready to sort of learn more about it. But even that's still like not a huge amount of people. No. I think, you know, the, the big audience that I think this, this book could appeal to, should appeal to, is, um, is people who are willing to sort of follow this guy's, I don't know, spiritual journey might sound too, too like ambitious, but, but to, fo to follow the journey that he's making through the quotidian sort of aspects of the racetrack and the mucking out of the stalls and the meeting with the trainers and the meeting with the race caller and the people who are on the board of the whole place. So, so, so at the end of it, although, you know, there's a lot about horses and the racetrack in the book, um, what's going on, I think, in the book is not primarily about horses and about racetracks, but it's about, you know, what's happening to him over the course of the narrative. I think, I, I think you're so right, and we, sh we should talk in a minute about what's happening with him yeah. in, the, in the course of the book, but it, it's a book that fits squarely in the, in the tradition of the literary journalist. But so it, the, the idea behind that is that there are journalists, they're sort of straightforward plotting journalists who are just kind of doing what they have to do, and then there's another group who are attentive to more artistic sort of aspects of what they're up to? Is that the idea? Yeah, they're also called immersion journalists. They usually write book-length pieces. I Think see. of John McPhee coming into the country, or um, I know you're interested in tennis as well as horse racing. John McPhee's book on Arthur Ashe, Levels of the Game. That is a great his, book. I'm probably one of the <laughs> ten people in this village who's read that. I'm that, one of them, That book is a great, great that's book. A, that's right. a great book. And that's, that's, again, a book which is yeah. about tennis, but also about it's a about, lot more. It's yeah. about a lot more than, than yeah. tennis. Um, Susan Orlean has sort of wonderfully said that the literary journalists are interested in the dignity of dailiness. Others oh. have, have described the radiance of the ordinary. They often look uh -huh. in real depth at, at events or trends or tribes. They're almost working ethno ethnographically sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Um, trying to bring back information huh. about the, the language, the rituals, the characters. Yeah. Who, who do those things, and, and this 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 feels to me like a book that fits squarely in that tradition. You know, we, we, you and I talked a little bit about, you know, what's going on from start to finish over the course of this book. What are the threads that are obviously the guys at the racetrack, and it's I don't know six weeks or something like that during spring season of a racetrack. 
Um, and so what are the threads that are going on that unite from start to finish? And one of them is obviously the, the, the issue of cancer, right? And is this the time to sort of talk a little bit about, the, yeah. you know, the book begins and we learn that uh, Barrich's mother has cancer and then soon after we learn that, we learn that she's died. Um, and as this metaphor, I guess a metaphor, it just kind of, yeah. it, it surfaces and, uh, you yeah. know, throughout the course of the book. The cancer, in a way, was less critical for me making sense of the book than just the grief that that engendered. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like this, maybe. Mm -hmm. He's so, you know, he's so undone mm -hmm. by the death of his mother. Um, and, and, he, and he sees that in terms of cancer, because that's what kills her, that he then sees like metastases yeah. everywhere. And sometimes, I, I don't know how we're supposed to take those similes. Some, I mean, maybe we yeah. can ask Bill this when he comes. Yeah. Maybe he really means them sincerely that, that there's, there's a great deal of critique of you know, modern American life that's going on yeah. in this in this book and yeah. and some of the excesses of it. And sometimes he puts those critiques in terms of like a kind of spreading cancerous yeah, growth yeah. and development. And yeah. I wonder if that's what he really, I'd really like to ask him this, if that's what he really thinks, or if instead what's going on is there's someone who himself is suffering terrible grief, projecting this metaphor of cancer out onto sort of the times in which he's living, but, you know, I don't know how central that remains to, yeah. like, what's, what bugs him about the world he's inhabiting, you know? It's, it's such a good question. I think the Barrett you encounter at the beginning of this piece is he's profoundly depressed. Yeah. He, he's trying to find ways to deal with his grief. There's his mother's death. There are also allusions to miscarriages, apparently. Yes. His, his wife had well, two miscarriages during this period. He doesn't say it directly in, in the book. She's operated on for, for a brain tumor that turns out not to exist. There are also hints that all is not well in the marriage. He says, I could have moved in with friends, yeah. but in, instead he left. He's, he's depressed yeah. and he's grieving and the notion that you suggest that he might be projecting that onto the larger world makes a kind of sense. He tries to go to, he goes to thrift shops and buys these objects, objects these that of nostalgia. Yeah. In yeah. Cloverdale I found ashtrays shaped like oranges yeah. and lemons and Hopland part of a grape press. So I'd like to, to stay on yeah. this theme a little bit because um, What's totally fascinating to me about this book, and, and you know, I've been through it now a few times, and it becomes more and more fascinating, is like the, the twin tracks of extraordinary like personal revelation. Yes. Um, at the same time that there is this like profound withholding yeah. of the personal. So like the, the passage you were just talking about, um, after, so we know his, his mother has this cancer, and they're, you know, he's, he's spending time with her. He says she's, he says, you know, she's a very good patient and she's chipper and doesn't dwell too much on this. And then uh, he talks about the track. This early on, he says, I thought my mother heard in the track announcers call a little pulse of life at the heart of the cancer, you know, which is interesting. But then the very next section of the book, he says this. Back home in California, I felt I fell into a lingering sadness. Mm -hmm. There were miscarriages and more cancers among relatives. And then my wife was operated on for a brain tumor, which proved not to exist except as a dark spot on an x-ray plate. Like, it's just, what a weird description. There were miscarriages and then more can Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, so th what you just said. So he's got these three things he wants squarely in our sights. And he, there are moments when he says, don't look over there. Yeah. Don't. Don't look at my brother. Don't look at my mother. Don't look at what's yep. going on with my marriage. Uh, he doesn't name Colgate, a place that he yep. he has is filled with ambivalence about. To, in, 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 so sometimes he he seems to lift the veil only right. to drop it back. Right. Down. But I so I, I the book I think kind of really works beautifully to defy your expectations of what's going. So early on, yes. there's this you know his mother dies, um, and then we don't get lots of. We, we just don't get reflections really on his life with his family, no. reflections on his mother. And no. then and then the the marriage, you know, you can put together, it's interesting, if you, if you, 
you can put together the how old he is if you pay attention to the yeah. dates, right? We know that this book is chronicling the spring of 1978. Yeah. And we know that because the f famous uh, Triple Crown battles between Affirmed and Aladar are going on. Uh -huh. So that lets us know it's 1978. He tells us that he... Um, that in 1963, he was 19 years old, yeah. I think. When he, so you can yeah. do the math, and so then you realize, okay, like so that so that means he's born in 44. So it's, it's in 78. So he's, he's about, about like 30. a third, yeah, his mid 30s. 30. Yeah. You know, the marriage is just the marriage is not. It's not really in this story in no. some weird no. way. Winter came. The money was running out. The things I wanted to write about remained just out of reach. Yeah. I argued with, with my wife, and she argued with me. We were older and childless and knee-deep in ruin. Yeah. And then he just decides, I'm going to go live at the racetrack. I mean, it's crazy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so you're reading the book, and I'm, I keep waiting for, like, okay, when's the wife going to come back yeah. in it? When's he going to? And you know what? He's on a different kind of journey, and... You know, he, so that's the sense in which, like, he you got you've got to go along with him, and it's and and it's doing something that I think is kind of pretty unexpected, yeah. and for that reason, just like you keep reading along, and at the end we'll talk about that. You know, there's the question of yeah. what is it that he's learned, what is it that yeah. we've learned from sticking with it. But I really appreciate yeah. the sense in which he's just not giving you like what I think most people are going to be expecting, what, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know what if. If that first chapter came to me in a creative writing class, I'm, I might say, this is a bait and switch. Uh -huh. You're not delivering what yeah. you're promising. Yeah. But I would be wrong. That's I, right. I have to say this. I, I would be absolutely wrong. He he does pull this off. And part of it has to do w with that voice, that voice of just quiet authority and certainty. He's, he's talking about a time of confusion and grief and chaos and the search for orderliness, one of the things that takes him to the racetrack is a sense yeah. that, that 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 you can crack that that game you can if, if you apply yourself and read the racing form diligently and yep. do your handicapping homework you, you can crack this but he but he writes about it with such a sort of cool most detached certainty and authority that 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 you trust him, and I think in the end it's right. But we haven't even gotten to the third thread. That this, the, he's he's got three things he wants to put before us here. One is the racetrack. One is his mother's death and his grief and working through that. And the third one is this experience he had while at Colgate, 15 years right. earlier. Do you want to talk about that? How do you read that? Yeah. So so that connects to this running theme of of these these. I don't know if they're, I guess they're memories or his retrospections on this m kind of magical time that he has in Florence as a, as a, I guess a junior study abroad. I mean, there is this obviously because we're at Colgate and we know that Bill's a graduate. Um, I was sort of wondering, is he going to talk about the school? And he does in this paragraph, which um, it, maybe this is a good time for me to read yeah. this one. What page so are you pa on? Page one fifteen. Um, so he doesn't name Colgate, as you say. He, he says, college had been a disappointment. In my first two years, I'd learned the meaning of J Press, how to look as though I'd gone to Exeter, how to make Fish House Punch, the quickest route to Skidmore, and a little about art and literature. This was not what I had expected. An abiding disillusionment set in, and I flunked American Ideals and Institutions, a required course, and drove my Chevrolet Impala across the frozen lawns of neighboring fraternities, destroying snow sculptures in the process. When the snow melted, I went with friends to a boathouse by a lake and drank beer all night long. At dawn, somebody almost shot me through the head with his 22. You could say I was confused. <laughs> <laughs> I'd accepted strange invitations, found myself in taverns and towns with one stoplight, existed on pickled eggs and whatever else pitying ladies happened to feed me, and once woke up on a couch in a minister's study somewhere near the Canadian border. Not good, I thought. Not good at all. A friend came to the rescue by telling me about a study program offered by another university, a semester abroad in Florence. It's cheap and they'll take almost anybody, he said. Certainly I fit the bill. That's, I think, probably maybe one of the most amusing <laughs> paragraphs in, in a book that doesn't have, you know, it's got some sly humor, yeah. but it's, you know, it's not, yeah. it's not a work of, of comedy at all. Um, so that, that is, you know, 
boy, that's a depiction of Colgate in the early 60s, much of which, you know, I mean, it doesn't sound completely alien to no. us, the driving the no. car across the fraternities with the snow sculptures. So, so you know, he's an interesting guy. He, he knows, he, he's thoughtful enough to know that something's wrong and that yeah. he needs to do something, right? Yeah. And so then Florence, this trip yeah. appears as like a lifeline or something. Yeah. Um, there, there's another passage where he says, and this is this is more of that like it's this authorial reticence or whatever. And he's just he said like that he went he goes to Florence to escape. That's mm -hmm. the word, which is mm -hmm. also a word that he uses describing going to the track. Yeah, the track. But he doesn't really tell us like what it is that he's escaping from. No. You know, and yeah. So in both cases, he. He doesn't say very much about it. You know that he loved his mother deeply, yes. but he doesn't give us his mother except in, in images of a, of a frail, dying woman right. with, with large eyes behind her spectacles who's enthusiastic briefly about the racing yeah. um, in, in her dying days. But he gives us just a similar small amount of, of, of his time in college at Colgate, it, it, just enough to know that he... It's another moment of sadness and dis and disorder yeah. and and confusion, similar to the moment when his his mother died, and as with the racetrack after his mother's death or while his mother's yeah. dying, he goes to Florence to to escape. So that there there are those those nice parallels. What he finds in Florence is <laughs> is wonderful, right? It's, yeah. He finds philosophy, he finds poetry, he finds architecture, he, he's happiest wandering through the galleries of the Uffizi, yeah. uh, I mean, writing those, poetry in coffee shops, he falls sitting on in the, love. Sitting on the roof of the British Library yeah. reading Yeats, you yes. know. It saves him, it saves him. Yeah, it's, so the, one of the ways maybe I read, and maybe I'm too optimistic or something like that, but in the, his description of his time at Colgate, and he's learning how to make punch and how to dress like J. Press, you know, and all that stuff. And he says, and a little about art and literature, right? Yeah. There's this really serious intellectual energy going on in this young yeah. man. But at that time in the early 60s, like, you know, I mean, Colgate was, I think, a different yeah. kind of place. Yeah. And it was just, he could not express that. And so he goes to Italy has all these wonderful things, falls in love. Not not with an Italian woman, though, interesting, no, with an no, American woman from Tennessee or something. Yeah. Um, but eats this wonderful food, is going through yeah. the Uffizi, and, and, the, and, and, and there, I feel like, is able to kind of be the sort of person that he turns out to be, this incredibly mm -hmm. lovely writer and a very sharp and, mm -hmm. and thoughtful um, and reflective man. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know what to take away from the, like what the resonance is on, of that for Colgate today. You, you could say Bill Barrich's experience at Colgate was unhappy and, and too bad and Colgate comes off looking bad. Or you could say that in that, in that rub yeah. at Colgate, in the rub of grief at his, his mother's early death and the marriage right. possibly turning sour, he, he turned to, to art, to writing. Yeah. He became... I know you've studied Freud. He that the writer became the analyst, yeah. and the analyst became the the, the writer. And the he he turned to writing and to the experience of others, to to the natural world as well, and yeah, and it's, healed himself. So it's not totally clear. I don't think it it should be, but it's not totally clear where the like where the restorative power is coming from. Is it coming from the retrieval of a certain kind of energy and aspirations that he had when he was a young person in Maybe. Italy, or is it m also or more the wor the the like the re repositioning of himself within that like Florentine culture that was you know from the 1480s and 90s that was mm -hmm. so so I don't know mm -hmm. I I can't figure that out I don't think we have to figure it out but it's it it's just like I I think. That that filtering, that layering, or whatever, yeah. makes makes it both more powerful and a little bit harder to diagnose with clear specificity. You know, here's what did the trick. And I think, you know, I hope you're not going to ask me that. <laughs> like, what did the trick? It seems like something worked. Something happened. Well, I'll just talk about that in a moment. Well, 
one thought I have in response to what you were just saying too is that in both these cases, both these moments of crisis, he did something physically. He took right. himself out of his comfortable right. environs and put himself in an uncomfortable place physically. I mean, his description of trying to find a place to stay uh, uh, yeah. when he was at the Golden Gate and yeah. and, and leaving the, the first place he finds after listening to the yeah, couple to next door argument, beat each right. other up. Which and, expects to end with yeah. gunshots or yes, something like that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He's physically uncomfortable and, right. and, and isolated, but also these were moments of, of profound intellectual yeah. Growth. So he, he was he was physically in a strange place and intellectually in a in a in a strange right. but also really stimulating place. He seems to posit that for him, transformation. You're right. Is too cheap. But well, but but change coming yeah. to accept change. He uses the word flux, and it's so interesting to me that at the beginning of the book he he looks backward to to nostalgia to the thrift shop. Um, and and but in the end he mm. looks he he looks forward he's he's trying right. throughout this book to find comfort and and solace in change at the same time that there's a kind of like description of of how the days unfold for him there's also this as you were talking about this kind of like continuity provided by a few different items one is as you said there's just it's a six week or seven, however long yeah. race season it's going to come to an end yeah. and he talks about it and you know now in the middle of the of the season you know then there's that one horse that we follow that we're not going to say anything about peachy. peachy yeah that um races and then disappears for a few chapters and comes back and yeah. and then returns towards yeah. the and there's a disquisition yeah. of the use of drugs yeah. here's uh, an account of thoroughbreds yeah. and, and the introduction of but that and that that's all i don't want to say balanced or like kept in place by these like larger and these themes. things that are happening in in time. Yeah. Again, th this is the impulse too of the literary journalists. Most of them, many of them, it's not to go to cover the the Belmont Stakes right. and the Kentucky Derby, the big race that's making yeah. the big headlines. But at at a moment when when America's caught up in horse racing fervor, to go to this dinky little track, I think dinky little track. Yeah, it's definitely not a major. Near San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. And and to write about horse racing from. From that perspective, that that that's part of the loveliness of this book. It seems to me he's not making. Similarly, he doesn't make grand claims about his personal story. He, people's yeah. mothers die, right. marriages have difficulty, marriages founder. He he doesn't make any yeah. any grand claims for an, an over for, for for the heroism of his own life or for the heroism of the people who are involved in yeah. this in this story it's a it's a it's a quiet book it's not a book with a great big grand climax the big horse race is yep. not right at yep. the end it seems we should talk about where he ends what what does he figure out he's foundering at the beginning of the book yeah. foundering in grief in uncertainty in chaos his mother's died his wife is ill. There are the miscarriages, to yeah. use his language. He's living in this trailer. He's driving around with his beer in the afternoon. He wants to be a writer. What does he figure out? So this is a kind of book, these books that begin, I don't want to say with crisis, but like yeah. with challenge and uh, unsettledness. And then at the end, the author says, the author pronounces that you know, she or he is now better. It's just a question of whether you buy, as a reader, do you buy the transforma the the transformation or the kind of the type of piece? It just change, yeah. Yeah. The, I, I well, I guess I do, even if it's yeah. a little bit hard. Well, here's what I was about to say: that I, I kind of feel like any account that we could give of it would be inadequate to what happens because. I mean, I don't, want, I don't want this to be a cop-out, but it seems like it's only by virtue of the experience that he has there that he's able to reach this kind of acceptance and this peace. Yeah. But he's at peace with his mother's dying um, because, because somehow he has a view of how humans fit into the natural world that he didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And I feel like saying that the horse is the medium 
of that understanding that he's reached or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I don't have that understanding, you know, because I didn't go through that thing with him. So I think he's describing it as best he can, even though at the end of the day, I don't know, I've, maybe you disagree with this. I was, I was going to say, like, you, you, can't, you can't come to experience that by reading someone else's account of it. But may, maybe you can, I don't know. We could ask him whether he, whether he would expect the reading of this to be as therapeutic as the experience of it appears to have been for him. A good question for him. I mean, just uh, one, uh, you know, get, just one last thing. All right. There's a really funny <laughs> sentence shoot that he has towards the end, and I'm, I'm not going to find it now, um, where he distinguishes between the cancer and the dying. Remember that? Mm -hmm. He's talking about mm -hmm. his mother, and he, sa and he says, like, so the cancer, that was just an organic and natural process yeah. of decay. Yeah. And the dying, uh, sorry, the, 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 sorry, the dying, sorry, the dying is an organic natural process of decay, but the cancer is, is associated with a whole bunch of like cultural trappings and um, and other parts that it's picked up. And I think if I read that right, he's he's trying to separate the two and he he's coming to peace with the death. Yes. And 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 he's being and he's jettisoning all the cancer associations that have like mm -hmm. totally dominated him. I'm sorry I can't mm -hmm. find that passage, but that's yeah, it's well, essentially what's going on. They're 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 gone. The imagery of the of the last few pages, the the image of the thoroughbreds running and, and I love what you say about horses and his insight about horses and he talks about thoroughbreds being an example of sort of wildness and domesticity. But the the image of of, of watching them it, it, it is so it's beautiful and it's natural and all that language of of cancer the the televisions the blue light the impoverishment yeah. of our lives is Johnny gone Carson's he says son. when i was in touch with the horses i felt the same way i felt on the river when i hooked a steelhead and it seemed to fire every neuron in my body transforming me into one long synapse bits of energy blowing apart it's yeah. that, that in some ways but as his mind and spirit have 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 come back together in the, in the in the sort of physical and intellectual exercise of going to the racetrack and going back to the Florentine yeah. philosophers and poets he's he's his body and the imagery of the natural world has become healthier right and Right. And the, the cancer is is gone. Yeah. All connections ever tenuous, living and dying, winning and losing. He, I let go of my mother. I was letting go of the sadness. Right. Watching the thoroughbreds, letting go of the sadness, letting go of my mother. My my favorite line from the book, although I love the ending about wonder and exploration, mm -hmm. that sense that you have to go out in order to heal the gesture of letting Christopher Columbus have the last few words of the book is so interesting, but my yeah. favorite sentence, nothing abides, yeah. no, cause no cause for, for alarm. alarm. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that nothing stays still, and that's okay. Right. That's not okay at yeah. the beginning of this book. Yeah, one, one, of the, one of the things in that essay is that that lets him realize that the grief he had been feeling, that won't abide either. No. Um, no. You know, and he'll be restored. The passage I was thinking of, just at, um, since I was trying to quote it, that, that it's a little bit after what you had read. When he says, I borrowed a device from the shield Lorenzo de Medici had carried in his betrothal ceremony, a bay tree half dead, half green, pictured above the motto, the spring returns. It was a good spring too, rich with promise. In my mind, the dying and the cancer had become separated, almost discreet. The one, a natural process of organic decay. The other, a cultural hastening of that process. And so, yeah, that. So he's he's returning. Somehow he's getting to this perspective where the natural world is sort of a, a our ally or something like that. Yeah. And we're and yeah. it takes the book to get there. I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's really marvelous. Thank you so much for talking. Uh, it was with great. Me I look today. forward to the visit. Yeah.